Right, thank you very much. Uh, great pleasure to be here to share a few ideas with you. Um, and my title is about neopatient testing, facilitating immediate informed decisions about prim uh, uh, pr patient care and primary care. And um, I guess I've focused my talk around really five bullet points, five things to think about in terms of point of care diagnostics and evaluations to facilitate uh, immediate patient-centered decisions. Um, <clears throat> now, um, I think perhaps the greatest contribution that I'm ever likely to make in this field is that I credit myself with inventing um, a very important point of care test that has revolutionized care in this country. And um, like, like Imran, I, I qualified in medicine about five years ago and initially worked as a medical registrar in a peripheral hospital in South Africa where the microbiology wasn't brilliant. And um, so I, I started to, to hold the urine sample up and look at the light. And, and if it was clear, I figured out there was no UTI. And then I came to this country, I was doing a locum in a disease palace up the road here. And sitting in the emergency room, and I was doing the Butler test. And one of my colleagues said to me, what are you doing? I said, I'm practicing stratified medicine here. We're doing a point of care test to direct antibiotics here. So this colleague of mine, he says, Butler, you can't do that in this country. It's a civilized country. <laughs> and they, that's bush medicine. You must go back to the bush. And you must practice it there if that's the way you want to practice. Now, it turns out, actually, that the evidence has grown and in the Health Protection England guidelines, that if the urine is clear, don't bother to culture it and don't give the person antibiotics. And um, that's me um, <laughs> accepting the Nobel Prize for stratified medicine. So to get a little bit more serious, I'm going to focus on antibiotic prescribing. Uh, Rupert's already mentioned uh, this is an important area for stratified medicine, and I'm not bringing genetics into this in any way, but perhaps biomarkers that might help us figure out uh, what to do. Now, don't get too worried about the details of this, but each of these stacks is a, a represents an antibiotic, and each of the columns represents a, a year, and this is data from Wales. There's amoxicillin um, and um, um, perhaps more importantly, comoxiclav, augmentin. And you can see with every year in the samples that are submitted from primary care, um, the number that are resistant is increasing. And that's a trend that is going up for gram negatives. So this is the problem that um, every time we look at this, we see increasing resistance year on year in real time. It's global warming for you uh, as, we, as, as we look at it. What does it mean? And here's a systematic review that uh, will, will, will come out in the next few days, where a Alistair Hayes' group in Bristol has correlated evidence that relates um, antibiotic exposure to antibiotic resistance. So the, the more likely, if you've taken antibiotics recently, you're more likely to have a resistant infection than a sensitive one. So we've taken that work a little bit forward and saying, but, but what is the implications of that? What, what does that mean for people in primary care? If you've got a resistant infection, how bad is it? And basically, on all respiratory tract and urinary tract infections, you're going to be sicker for a whole lot longer. And a study I did in Wales showed that, in fact, if you've got a resistant infection, urinary tract infections, common everyday type of infection. You're going to be sicker for twice as long. And you're going to take a whole lot more antibiotics. You're going to consult a whole lot more. So it's, just, it's not just the sick guys in the hospitals on death's door where we worry about antibiotic resistance. There are common infections in everyday primary care. And for these uh, women, the urinary tract infections, you know, 10% of them will uh, have had an infection um, in, in the past year, or symptoms of an infection in the past year, and, and uh, half of women will have one in their lifetime. So, primary care, they all get better, but actually, 
If we look at bacteremia data uh, in Wales, we can see that bacteremias, these are E. coli bacteremias that started out in the, in the community are going up for each age group. The lines represent the top lines, the oldest age group. But even in the, even in the younger people, bacteremia is being more common and the proportion of those that are resistant uh, is going up every year as well. So it's a serious problem. Of course, the newspapers do the natural thing and that's to blame the baboons in the community, um, of which I'm proud to be one. And they think it's a simple problem. Uh, what, what do these damn GPs think they're doing? Interesting, I was talking to a microbiologist the other day um, who was saying, why aren't you guys prescribing more antibiotics? Because all these people are turning up in the hospitals with sepsis. And now in the surgery, there's a line saying, could you have sepsis? Tell your GP. And so the GPs go, okay, you know, I might have sepsis. Oh, better give you some. So there's, you know, you're between the devil and the deep blue sea. And it's not a simple matter. It's what I've called the toxic storm. And, and Rupert alluded to this already, that there's going to be no single simple solution here because the, the pressure of general practice at the moment isn't a, a fantasy or a rumor. And I saw something in the paper yesterday about practices that are just one resignation about falling over. And um, uh, even in leafy Oxfordshire, it's almost impossible to recruit a patient, uh, I mean a GP, in, in, and practices have just closed suddenly overnight because some guys just hit the wall and can't take it anymore. So one of the things uh, that's important to, to figure out is, is actually the point of care testing. Um, but that on its own, I don't think is going to solve this problem, but it could be a key ingredient. Um, but all these other things about communication, trust, and continuity. So I've done some qualitative research in, in six countries which showed that taking antibiotics is quite dependent on your relationship with your provider, with your GP. Um, and those people who trusted their GP and felt that their GP knew them and their child would take antibiotics even if they didn't want to, if the GP told them, and vice versa. So this thing about you know the traditional bedrock of primary care, continuity of care and trust is being substituted with a computer and the government feels that it's fine to have continuity on the basis of an electronic medical record, but it isn't the same. So it, it, it does require something that isn't a one-trick pony. The goal is simple for stratified medicine in this area. You want to keep the antibiotics away from those who are not going to benefit. So you need to know that. And you've got to give the antibiotics to those. You don't want to deny people who are going to benefit from antibiotics. And the, 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 the panel, the um, Longitude Prize was mentioned, and I, I happen to be on the jury of that. And I think mistakenly that prize, or a lot of people think about that prize, as distinguishing between a virus and a bacteria. And actually, there are a lot of bacterial infections that'll get better the same rate whether you give them antibiotics or not. And some people with a viral infection might benefit from an antimicrobial, but also from an antibiotic. So the issue is not etiology so much, and I'll return to this, but potential benefit. And um, the McNeil report um, uh, come out really promoting point of care diagnostics as, as the thing that will solve this problem. But uh, McNeil himself in his foreword said, I find it incredible that doctors must still prescribe antibiotics based on their immediate assessment of the patient's symptoms just like they used to when antibiotics first entered common use in the 1950s. <clears throat> Everything we do in this field must take the social determinants of health into account. Um, so trials that we've done in the UK, for example, might not uh, be applicable to populations, say, back when I was inventing the baboon test. Um, as the social determinants of health improve, so do infections and their complications, and so should antibiotic prescribing be reduced. And we'll always sort of overshoot a little bit, but matching 
your goals of prescribing to the prior probability of illness and disease is important and taking into account context is, is, is cr critical here because um, it, it's an ongoing field. In a way, this is a research program without end because resistance profiles are changing all the time as are the social determinants of health. And evidence that was uh, generated in one place might not be applicable uh, to a different time and place. So to get on to my five bullet points, as it were, um, in this field, uh, we, we, we find biotechnology driving it a lot of the time. And many, many, many is the time that uh, I've been approached by a person very excited by some technology. They said, look, I, I can give you a gene. I can tell you the gene for something within so many minutes, and every GP needs this and will buy it. And, you know, so I said, well, why would the GP want to know that? Uh, and I said, well, it, you know, maybe there's an ESBL or something. Uh, and I said, you know, it's, it's, they don't care about that. They're not interested. And in any case, you can get into a situation where the evidence uh, is, is very suboptimal. But the person's got a technology, find it can give you an answer, and then goes looking for the problem. And that problem is very often not relevant to practice. And so the way around this is to start with the clinical problem. What is the niche? And here's an example of what we called a, a functional requirement specification that we developed before we started to develop a new point of care test, the EU-funded project. And this was for patients with community-acquired low respiratory tract infection. And um, key thing here, if you know, based on clinical grounds, you um, don't think the patient's got a bacteria, it's clearly a virus, you don't need a test, you don't need an antibiotic either. And if person's got bronchial breathing and consolidation, you're not going to want to test either, you're just going to give them treatment. But when uncertain ground, that's the time when you need a diagnostic test. Um, and do you need to just know the, the bacteria? Do you need to quantify it? Uh, and do you know, need to know the sensitivity? So figuring out where all of these things, or do you need to give the patient an antiviral? And figuring out where all these things sit in the clinical pathway and how your clinical test will, will help you and what the performance characteristics uh, are, 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 are for this test ahead of your, your time. So you can tell the biotechnologist how to develop this test so it does occupy a clinical niche because there's so many wonders of biotechnology sitting on the shelf. Uh, we just heard about one um, a, a minute ago where the cost was wrong and perhaps it wasn't giving you the right information. So starting with a clinical need with a bottom-up development of, of, of a functional requirement specification is important. And developing an intended use statement, like where is it going to be, what must the... Um, 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 sort of uh, a maintenance, storage, etc. What kind of sample do you need? What's the time to uh, result, and so on, it is critical. And th this sort of model uh, we developed around sort of from from an airways infection here in primary care. If it's typically viral, you don't need a point of care test. If you're uncertain, a point of care test is going to be helpful. Um, and as you sort of go up here, here you, in the ICU, you're going to want to know what the bug is and what its sensitivities are and so on. So figuring out context and setting uh, and prior probability is critical. Uh, oh, sorry, going the wrong direction here. Yeah. So second bullet point, and, and in a way this is part of the first one, um, think about what you're trying to achieve, you know, and as I say, the longitude price seems to be focusing on is it a virus? Is it a bacteria? The etiology isn't that critical. And what we're more interested in as GPs is prognosis. That original two by two table that I showed you, um, you know, who's going to benefit, who's not going to benefit. The reasons for that, let the clever guys in the lab figure out. But, you know, from the decision making point of view, that's not so critical uh, to get into the etiology. Um, most important and the patient's voice comes very clearly to the fore when you ask them about point of care diagnostics and some qualitative work that we've done. They say they're delighted to have uh, additional diagnostic. It helps them feel confident that good decisions have been made for them, but they do not want 
communication and thorough clinical examination and assessment substitute by a number that's spat out of a machine. That is one component that needs to be taken in the um, assessment of me as a person. Also, diagnostics at the point of care, like what's not to like, okay? Except that there could be a whole lot of unintended consequences. So, for example, C-reactive proteins, a biomarker, used in Sweden a lot, uh, in Nordic countries, and they, those GPs get paid each time they use it, eh? reimbursed. So, it's like neurologists in Boston, they all own a CT scanner, so if you go there with a headache, the probability of you getting a CT scanner, the brain is 100%. So, if you go into Sweden with a cough, the probability of getting uh, a CRP test is very high too, and then next time that you've got a cough, Oh, I better get down to the GPs for the old CRP test, and this can increase help seeking in conditions that we're trying to promote um, um, self care. So, unintended consequences of, of, of any kind of test needs to be considered very carefully. Um, so, here's just a qualitative study which shows that GPs aren't that interested in etiology because. Uh, you know, some of them will say, um, even if those throat infections that are bacterial, a lot of them are going to be self-limiting in any way. And so many people with a thing that says, is it bacterial or viral on a test? But actually, up to 30% of people are going to have a commensal streptococcus in the throat. And so you're going to overtreat if you use that thing. And if you're all going to get better in any case, is it that exciting? Um, so the patient's perspective saying, you know, treat, treat, treat the patient and, and, and not the, uh, uh, the numbers. Interestingly, when, when we asked GPs who had used point-of-care tests, what was useful about the CRP test in this case? They said, I knew the result in any case. It's never surprised me. But it's really helpful when I'm talking to the patient who's desperate for antibiotics. Because um, then I can say, look, you know, I, I think you don't need antibiotics, and the machine too. And I don't know if you know the CRP test, but it's you know, a nice little thing on your desk, and it makes a very satisfactory whirring noise, and comes up there, and you know, like so. So this thing can be an aid to communication. But interestingly, the diagnostic or prognostic element wasn't that, uh, you know, it, it wasn't um, um, that, that, that kind of uh, exciting to the GPs. Okay, I'll, I'll skip over that. Um, importantly, when people evaluate these tests, they take a test and then compare it to a gold standard, the analytic performance, which is generally pretty unhelpful. So does the point of care test tell you the same result as <clears throat> the machine in, in the lab? Whereas really what we want to know is over and above the existing diagnostic process, what additional value does the test give you? So how much added diagnostic value? And, and if we look at this as something that we did on CRP and, in fact, um, uh, procalcitonin for people consulting with acute, acute cough, you can see that we have a, an area under the curve there of, of the blue. And the closer this curve gets there, the better the diagnostic performance of it. And this is the diagnostic values, simple s symptoms and signs predicting um, pneumonia in primary care patients with acute cough. So I I if we then add procalcitonin, that gives you the exact same line as examination on its own. Uh, but if you add in C-reactive protein, that gives you some diagnostic, um, added diagnostic value. So that's the type of information you need. Um, and in deciding whether to bring a test into clinical use or not, and, you know, again, the patient's, the clinician's perspective, want to know that the test is accurate. You know, what do you have to do to make sure that it keeps being accurate? You know, who's going to go around and check it and do run the sample tests and so on? How quickly uh, does it give you a result? Is it easy to use? Can anyone in the practice use it? How often are you going to use it? There's no point in having a huge machine that you're going to use once a month. Or if you're using it a lot, can you put a lot of samples through? 
at the same time or do you need to wait? Say it takes 40 minutes and you've got patients to, that you want to test but there's already test in the machine. Um, so, you know, uh, is the indication for the testing clear? Is it easy to interpret? Is it going to affect the decision then and there? Um, and critically, does it make a difference? There are so many tests, so many things that we can do, but I think there's virtually, there are virtually no tests available to primary care where we actually have evidence that it improves patient outcomes. So if you manage patients with that test, it's going to give you a better patient outcome than if you manage them with, without that test. There are not many. And, and there are not many that prove cost effectiveness in terms of those patient outcomes. So that's the point that, uh, that, that, that we need to, 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 to be focused on. You know, can do amazing things, give you an answer in a very quick time. It can be in a tiny thing. But can we really say honestly and truly that it improves care? And there's so many biotechnology companies that are frustrated with the NHS. And they say the NHS is terrible. It's like a dinosaur that you can't shift. And I'm fed up. I'm going to America. Because in America, that's where they're reasonable and they into innovation. And here we are dinosaurs and terrible. But I always ask the question, have you got evidence that your wonder of technology improves patient outcomes and is cost effective? And that's generally where the conversation stops. Critically, Study design is a very complex thing here, where at which point you randomize the patients um, and what your intervention is. Is it training, for example, clinicians to use a device or are you assessing the use of the device? Um, and so there's many um, important uh, research methods that need to be taken into account when you're considering such evidence because in your evidence, was the patient given the diagnostic test was a valid test result produced? Was that test result used to make a proper diagnosis? Was that diagnosis uh, relevant to the management decision at the time? And did the GP implement that? And then did that improve outcomes? So that's quite a lot of steps where a lot of things can go wrong. And unless you can show all those things, in my view, no new test should be introduced into in, in, into practice. So I want to give you an example of some trials we did of C-reactive protein um, to try and improve antibiotic uh, use for low respiratory tract infection. And uh, this is uh, the IMPACT trial where we uh, the cluster randomized, randomized 40 GPs um, and, and they enrolled patients who were presenting with acute cough. And um, in this case, uh, about 70% got, got antibiotics. <clears throat> that went down to around about 40% if, if the GPs used the CRP point of care. Um, if they just used advanced communication skills, which basically involves asking patients about what they thought was going on, what they thought about antibiotics, giving them a proper follow-up and proper assessment, was actually better than the point of care test uh, in terms of reduced antibiotics. But if you give them the communication skills plus the point of care test, it gives you a dramatic reduction and, and these two uh, seem to work together. Um, and it's cost effective actually, um, both the communication skills training and the point of care test. So we, we did a similar study now in six countries in Europe and um, again, it was a similar factorial design, and uh, the impact, uh, the study was similar to the, uh, the, the, the um, communication skills training and, and the CRP, and um, uh, we got similar results that was sort of replicating that study, if you like, in, in six countries with much large numbers, although the communication skills training there wasn't so effective because it was on, online, in my view. Um, Rupert mentioned the uh, POETIC study, and um, it's just looking at uh, uh, urinary tract infections, and um, 
we, we, we've done a, a, a trial of a point of care culture which is uh, being considered in, um, in, uh, for a journal at the moment, and I, I won't go into the answers of that, but the observational side of it showed in, in Wales, England, and Spain, and the Netherlands that we, um, we, we are giving different amounts of antibiotics to the same patients and completely different antibiotics as well. So wherever you see something like that with such variation in care, we need to be really alert to opportunities for improved harmonized care. Um, so he, he, he has another example of a trial using a point of care test uh, to target antibiotics for acute exacerbations of COPD. Because on the one hand, people with COPD, you want to get rid of the infection quickly, give them, some people would say, hit them hard with heavy duty antibiotics. Other people say, look, you make, no one's got sterile lungs. And if you're hitting them with lots of antibiotics, maybe those bugs are getting sort of more resistant over time and that the patients will get more exacerbations that are harder to treat in the future. So we don't really know the answer to that. But we know that people, even with COPD with a low CRP, do not benefit from antibiotics in primary care in certain studies. So we randomized GPs to, no, we randomized patients to get care who were acutely exacerbating with a CRP or not. And um, so, you know, the um, control is current best practice and the intervention is CRP point of care test um, plus training in the interpretation of it and current best practice. And um, I'm happy to say that exactly one month ago we, we randomized our target of 650 patients with exacerbations and um, next week I'll have the answer um, for the four-week outcome to see whether this way of stratifying patients using a biomarker has been helpful or not. But uh, today I'm unable to give you that answer. Now critically, I've mentioned throughout this that uh, a point of care test on its own is not going to really help anything here. It's a behavior change issue. And to change human behavior, I think this is perhaps the most important slide that I have, you'll get many, many different views of theoretical stances about behavior change. And um, be, being a GP from the bush, I've tried to figure out a model which is simple but intuitive. And basically, people are going to be more ready to change if they believe that change is important and if they can change. So the sense of importance of change and their confidence in their ability to do it. So there's no point in trying to get them to target antibiotics better if they don't really believe that resistance in primary care is a problem. In other words, if they have a low sense of importance. Similarly, they might be passionate about doing something about antibiotic resistance, but if they've got no tests, no time, if their toxic storm is weighing down heavily upon them, and they just feel unable to act in any meaningful way, you're still going to get readiness to change down there. So you need both components. And um, I just saw this trial last night, actually, when I was thinking about this talk. And, and here they did a trial in the States in the emergency room hospitals where they had procalcitonin biomarker and a, a viral point of care test. And they randomized patients to get treated with that or with usual care. And guess what? Even when there was like a virus, clearly on the point of care test, and a low PCT, they prescribed antibiotics in exactly the same amounts as the other side. Uh, so unless you get into the behavior chain side of this and understand what's going on, all, all your stratification um, technologies are going to be, be, be meaningful. And you know, thinking about importance, importance for whom? Confidence, you know, what are those things? Well, we, we've gone on to the functional requirement specifications already, but, you know, cost is critical. Who's going to pay for this? You know, you guys, why aren't the GPs buying these CRP machines? I said, well, why would they? Because, you know, their profits are going down like that. The guys in the lab aren't going to give up their budget. So what the heck, you know? Um, they're not doing too badly at the moment. So really, uh, we need the evidence that it makes meaningful difference, but they can fit it into their routines that it's feasible for them and that they can uh, 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 um, uh, manage it cost-wise as well. 
And then my, my final slide is really in this whole process. I mean, what we're trying to do is put a microbiology lab in this case in, in, into a matchbox. And, you know, a lot of funders get frustrated. You know, I gave you a grant three years ago and you haven't made the machine yet that can sort this out. And what's going on there, you know? It, it's, not, it's not a simple matter and it, it takes a long time with a lot more investment. And uh, in a way, funding models aren't really that good to develop this kind of thing because it needs a time horizon that is beyond most SMEs' uh, vision and beyond the time horizons of most grants. So those are my thoughts, and um, thank you for, for giving me the opportunity of sharing them with you.